Hi everyone, welcome to Cancer Healing Journey Talks. Myself Sonali Modi from Community Outreach Team of ZenOnco.io and Love Heals Cancer. We guide cancer patients on adopting an integrative oncology treatment approach. We help them find the balance between medical treatment and complementary treatment approaches. We also help our patients with our team of oncologists, lab experts, nutritionists, and other healthcare professionals so that we can improve the treatment outcome for patients. We also help in connecting patients with other cancer warriors who are currently going through the same journey. And we also share inspirational journeys of cancer warriors on our platform to motivate other cancer warriors. So firstly, I would like to uh, welcome Ms. Lauren Tarpley. She's a cancer warrior. I'm happy that you're here with us today to share your story. So Lauren, please tell us something about yourself. Hi, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. Um, something about myself. Um, so I was diagnosed uh, about a little over a year ago in September of 2020 at the age of 34. Um, I had a 14 month old, 17 month old son at the time. So, you know, it was very shocking. And, um, you know, at that time just had to figure out a path forward and forge through. Yeah. yeah. So like what made you go for the diagnosis and what were the initial symptoms? So I started preventative treatment at the age of 30. Um, I started getting mammograms at the age of 30 just to be hypervigilant. And at the time, actually, it was time for my annual mammogram, but I had a very, very persistent pain in my armpit. Um, I now know that means that the cancer had spread to my lymph nodes, but that was the only sign that I had. Um, as I didn't have a lump or anything like that, my tumor could not be felt with a self-exam. It had to be uh, found with the mammogram and then an ultrasound, and then it was biopsied. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, during the treatment, uh, when you came to when when you first came to know that you had cancer, like how this news was disclosed to you and your family? Oh, they called. Uh, yeah. And I've spoken to a lot of other, you know, cancer patients and people who have been diagnosed and mm -hmm. the vast majority of them said that they were told over a phone call, unless it was an emergency biopsy and they were able to tell them right then and there. Um, but yeah, they called me, um, on a Friday and then I had to break the news to my family after I was uh, officially diagnosed. Okay, like how did you all face it? Well, it wasn't easy. It, it kind of came as a shock since this wasn't my first mammogram, right? So this was my fourth one. And, you know, I, I just expected it to go like all the last. Again, I didn't have a lump. Uh, you couldn't feel my lesions. And um, I really just thought, you know, my doctor had told me that the armpit pain was an ingrown hair. And so I was kind of going off of that and I just went in to get the mammogram as I do annually. And so once I was diagnosed, you know, we just went into research mode, you know, getting all the information I could on my cancer, my subtype, whether it was hormone driven, everything like that. Um, you know, my best friend told me and she, you know, she's a, she's an anesthesiologist. She told me the opposition of fear is information. And, you know, nothing rings more true. If you know what you're facing, if you know the statistics and the outcomes, what you're going to go through, if you have some sort of idea, you're going to be a little less afraid. And so we just started researching what were the stages, you know, clearly I had found it early. I was lucky enough to have a baseline. I was lucky enough to have former mammograms that we could ensure that it hadn't been growing for longer than a little over a year. Right. So to know that instead of not knowing anything as a 34 year old, because that would normally be someone's first ultrasound or first mammogram, you know, that that helped alleviate a little bit of the stress and the panic. But mm -hmm. like I said, just researching and seeing what we needed to do to move forward and to to be cured. Uh, one of my initial physicians, you know, said something very interesting to me that will always, always resonate and and with me is that, um, you know, early detection, which was, I was lucky enough to have hmm. will be the difference between you being curable and treatable. And hmm. so those words really helped as well. 
yeah so like what made you uh, what treatment have you undergone i did six rounds of thcp chemo mm. i did 11 rounds of herceptin targeted immunotherapy i had 25 rounds of radiation i've had a double mastectomy and i'm currently doing reconstruction now okay so that's a long process hmm. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so like we all know that chemotherapy is a very tough routine so like please share your experience and how you coped with it and what all difficulties you faced during the treatment time sure so uh you know just to lay it out i i'm specifically i i had her two positive hormone receptor negative and i was also brca negative and when you get your genetic testing done once you're diagnosed to see if you're brca positive or negative to see if you're going to need further treatment further surgeries things like that you know that's all taken into account with your treatment plan um i fortunate or unfortunate however you look at it um i was hurt too so that means i didn't have to do any hormone therapy after my initial treatment um so you know it went six rounds of thcp and those are every 3 weeks for my treatment plan and then after those six the herceptin was every 3 weeks as well so it was a total of about 53 weeks or so so they said give us a year give us your mm -hmm. your treatment is going to take a year so you know in pers in perspective and when someone gives you a timeline that's helpful to me instead of just ongoing and infinite treatment give me a year give it your all and again that helped me so uh you know starting off with chemo and everyone starts different depending on what subtype and what stage and what grade your cancer is uh we started with chemo and a girlfriend of mine who had gone through it said if you start with chemo and then you have surgery then radiation it's going everything is going to get easier you know radiation is easier than surgery is easier than chemo chemo is was the hardest part for me uh because it also came on the tail end of the realization and so the mental aspect of the diagnosis um mm -hmm. just realizing that really realizing your limitations realizing how much of a support system you need um chemo was really harsh uh but i would say with what i've heard and seen others go through i tolerated it rather well so mm -hmm. you know on the first after the first cycle my hair got a little thin after the second cycle my hair completely i mean it was falling out in clumps and i had already gotten a short haircut so that it wasn't so dramatic or and there there wasn't hair everywhere uh but we had to shave my head about 2 days after the second round of chemo um other than that is things you'd never think about um you lose your taste um because the chemo i mean it just goes in and it kind of resets your whole body um so lost my hair all you know body wide um lost my taste lost my smell for a little bit um you get neuropathy like the tingling in your hands and feet um it can affect your bones um your white blood cells are made in your bones and they give you a shot after each cycle to boost your white blood cell uh recreation and stimulation uh to fight any kind of infection to keep you healthy through chemo um so then you know they and then they give you steroids so you know you're hungry and you want to eat but you can't taste anything so you know it's it's a comedy of errors and there's a, there's just a lot going on there um but yeah so my my specific side effects um a lot of gastrointestinal distress um you know that that loss of taste is it's a big one because food is really important to me. <laughs> um I like to bake in my spare time so it's really hard to bake if you really can't smell very well and uh you've you know lost the taste that you had. Um and so those are pretty much you know my main symptoms, the hair loss, a lot of stomach troubles. Um you know you're you're weak, you know you're very tired down to your, down to a cellular level. so you're just exhausted you're inexplicably exhausted when you haven't done anything and you know your your body is just going through so much but 
yeah, I would say those were the biggest ones. Yeah. So, like, how did you overcome your fear of uh, side effects and treatment? Uh, again, just head on, right? Because the the those six cycles, again, everything has a time limit, and as long as you stay healthy, the time limit for me was eighteen weeks. All I had to do was do this for 18 weeks. And we've all done things we don't want to do. We've all had to do things that we don't care for. And that was just another one of these things, right? Like I'm a mom, like I've had to change diapers. I've had to wake up 82 times in a night. So, you know, is again, for me, if I know what I'm, what is ahead of me, at, at least somewhat, then I, I can do it. And so I just said, okay, you know, like this day, this, this was a stinker. Like we've got, we've got a hundred more days, right? I've got 16 more weeks. And so at the end of the day, it just kind of came down, it came down to a countdown and, and just surviving. Yeah. So it's very tough for cancer patients and for survivors also like to go through this journey and they require some support system during such times to who was your support system along with the family? Yeah, so my family was first and foremost, uh, but, you know, I found a huge community on Instagram specifically. I'm pretty sure whichever social media platform is your forte, um, you'll find that community. But for me, it was Instagram. Like, I'm just well-versed in Instagram, and that was my social media platform of choice. I mean, my husband's been doing research even since, and he said he's found a, you know, a big community on Reddit, and I know there's a huge community on Facebook, and, um, you know, everything between Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram kind of pushes to each other, so, uh, but the people I've met on Instagram have just been incredible. I've met up with some of them in real life. Um, Some of them are just too far for that, you know, during the pandemic and at this time, but just meeting other women and a couple of men that have gone through what I've gone through, um, that just know without saying too much, right? Just chemo, you know, or oh, radiation, you know, j- you can say those things and they get it and they know. And that's really important. It's, it's important no matter if you find community within your stage, within your subtype, within your genetic Pre, you know, predisposition, any of those things to find people that are like you that understand so that you're not funneling all this angst or sadness or anger to one channel, right? Not just your primary caretaker, not just your mom, not just your dad, definitely not your kids if you can avoid it. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to protect my husband, protect my parents, protect my in laws as much as I could. Um, without just dumping all of this on one person all the time. So it was just really important that I found those people. And I never, ever, ever thought the internet would be a good place to find support like that. So um, yeah, that, I mean, I know that there's a lot of um, like groups that meet in real life, you know, locally, but support groups weren't just really weren't my forte at the time um, when I was going through treatment because I didn't just want to sit in a room and talk about our treatment and our side effects like that that wouldn't personally help me um but yeah the Instagram community was imperative so what do you think are the importance of such support groups for people means what message you would like to give in regards to a support group to other cancer patients and survivors like why they should join such support groups uh like i said it, it just so to speak to other people who know exactly what you're going through and so that you can unload you know it's a heavy mental load to go through this you have to face your mortality i mean at at whatever age you're diagnosed you know cancer inherently has death attached to it. And so, you know, that's kind of my mission is to educate, but also de-stigmatize. Cancer is not taboo. Um, I think for the most part, when people get diagnosed or someone hears about a diagnosis, their first thought is, well, what did you do to get it? You know, are you a smoker? Are you a heavy drinker? Things like that. And we're not, we're not going to victim blame here. I think moving forward, education will show that 
you know, for the most part, it, it sells and what they decide to do or your genetics. And so um, just these groups are just so important. So you can attack the mental health aspect of the disease and the diagnosis. Mm. So did you try any alternative treatment? I did not try alternative treatment for cancer, but I have tried a lot of alternative treatments for mental health and to regain strength and uh, like physical strength, you know, in a time of extreme weakness. So, you know, I've done hypnotherapy. I've done a lot of acupuncture, a lot of acupressure, a lot of dry needling, cupping. And these were to battle side effects, like mental side effects, anxiety, PTSD, um, I'm seeing an oncological therapist, a regular therapist. I'm seeing a lot of doctors. Um, but when it came to the treatment, um, they had just made such strides in her two research that had proven successful, especially in the last decade. Um, and I'm just grateful to have had that, that I feel that whoever wants to try alternative treatments more power to you. And, and I think that's amazing. Um, and the only people I really know that have tried alternative treatments are people that were diagnosed with either a, a rare cancer or at a very high stage. Um, but personally, no, I did not for the targeted cancer treatments. Yeah. So like, how did you manage your emotional well-being during those times? Not well. <laughs> I would say, um, you know, I, I was just really, really emotional. Um, again, you know, there are moments of clarity where the information and the education comes through and you can cope. Um, but then sometimes your emotions just get the best of you. Um, and again, you're facing your mortality and I'm facing my mortality at 34 when I, I'm not, I'm not done yet. I'm not finished here. I've got more to do. I have an infant son. I, I want to have more kids. I, I'm trying to grow as, as an employee in corporate America. I, I have so many more things I want to do. And so, uh, yeah, you know, when things just got really hard and it kind of seemed a little bleak, I would definitely get emotional, but that's when I would need to, you know, use my coping skills and reach out to medical professionals, mental health professionals, and get right back on track because, you know, cancer is a full-time job. Treatment is a full-time job and being a mom is a full-time job. Have, running a household is a full-time job. And so, you know, if I were to let those emotions and those intrusive thoughts get the best of me, uh, then I wouldn't be the best mother, wife, and person I could be to, to withstand treatment. I mean, a, a lot of it is mental and a lot of it is attitude and not all of it, but a lot of it is. And so once you get to the place where you can cope or whatever works for you, you, you just got to push through. Yeah. So, you know, there are days when you feel that it's too much to handle, but you still don't give up. So what was the one thing that kept you going and kept you motivating on such days? Probably my son, probably my son. Um, definitely my husband, he's my number one cheerleader, but just to see the person that I created and know that he needed me, I had to completely slow down cut out anything that was not a priority during that, especially during chemo, um, because you're just, you just have so little to give and you have to make sure what you're giving is quality and not quantity and that you can afford to give it that emotional support that like the physical getting up, going outside, going on walks, playing with my son so that was probably my motivation and then second was just that I need to live I need to push through and about halfway through treatment halfway through chemo specifically I had a realization that I just needed to share and I needed to let people know that they weren't alone in their feelings um, no matter on what level that I connected with it. If you're a woman, if you're a mom, if you're a wife, if, if you're African-American, if you live in the South, if you live in America, any of these things, you're not alone. You're not the only one. 
And that, you know, that's really helpful to people too, to know that if they hadn't sought out community, that there's still a community for them and that is here to support them too. Yeah. So like, what were the things that helped you and made you happy on this journey? Food. (laughs) When I could taste it, just really good food. And when I had an appetite, right? So, you know, there's going to be times where you do and you don't have an appetite. And I just had to eat what I could when I could, but really just unplugging and just watching silly, silly TV, nothing serious. And I mean, that came on word from my therapist, Lauren, unplug, turn your brain off, watch something funny, watch, watch something without commercials. You know, you can't control what commercial, you can control what content you see, but you can't control what commercials you see. Um, Watch something without commercials like just relaxing, wearing super comfortable socks and eating ice cream. Like that's just, you know, it's really the little, little, little things that you overlook that become so, that stand out the most. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the things I like to do is like get in sweatshirts and um, put on fuzzy socks, like in the winter and eat ice cream. (laughs) And, you know, I was going through treatment in the winter and I got to do that quite a few times. So yeah, it's just the really little things that you probably won't ever remember again, you know, any later, any far removed from this journey, like I'm a a year out. um, I might, I might not remember that, but yeah, those are kind of the things that got me through. Yeah. So very well said that uh, it's the small things in life, which we overlook. But uh, after some time, after years, when we like, oh, means recollect those memories, then we will get to see that the small things are the ones which we should value the most. Exactly. Yeah. So like, did you make any lifestyle changes during or after the treatment? I did. So um, I made a point to, I, before cancer, I worked out about six times a week. Um, even all the way through pregnancy, I worked out the day I gave birth. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, so when I was diagnosed and going through treatment, you know, you lose a lot of energy, you lose a lot of your physical ability. Um, and you just have to work at it. You really have to push through because there are days you really, you might not be able to get out of bed. Not even that you don't want to, you just aren't able um, so I, I worked out as much as I could and that really just consisted of walks. Um, but I did increase, which, you know, I was a pretty healthy eater before, but I did increase, um, vegetables and I definitely decreased my alcohol. Um, you know, I was kind of a one, two glass of wine a night and, you know, that adds up. So I think I have about, you know, a couple of glasses of wine a week now. And I really like that lifestyle change. Um, alcohol is, <laughs> uh, has heavily revolved around my life. I mean, I used to work in, in the industry. And so that's kind of where I picked up those habits and then just kept on with that through later being a later mm-hmm. in adult life. But yeah, I like that I've cut down on that. Um, and that's really it. Like maybe looking for organic now where I did it before. And I know that's not really important, but we're kind of in the age now where organic is it's it's more accessible and so um and sometimes it's not any more expensive so just making little tiny lifestyle changes like that um i make i make it a point to go on a walk every day um i've definitely reprioritized things in my life so before diagnosis work was top three and maybe tied for number one at times with my son, with my family. And then work was a a three-way tie. Now it's not that way at all. Uh, My family is number one. I'm tied for number one, I guess. I mean, that's kind of a mom Mm -hmm. answer, but work is, is not top three anymore. Um, I, I'm very appreciative of my position. I'm very fortunate to work for the company that I do because they really value their employees but um, I can't put work above my own well-being anymore. Um, that's just going to welcome a lot of stress. And that's not, that's really not the way that I care to live uh, moving forward. So yeah, I mean, it's, 
I've, I've taken a lot of silver linings away from this and kind of took it as a warning um, because I was fortunate enough to catch it at an early stage. And so that's just how I'll proceed moving forward. But yeah, I like the lifestyle changes I've taken from it. Yeah. So like, do you think that cancer has changed you in a positive way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've devoted myself and, you know, for the foreseeable future, I will be an advocate for AYA cancer patients, the cancer community and, uh, you know, breast cancer um, for, you know, advocating for uh, screenings uh, earlier and earlier in everyone's life, because again, men are affected as well. But, you know, I just want to be an advocate and I want to be a beacon to just show that no matter how you approach it, as long as you do approach it and acknowledge it, um, that, you know, it's manageable. Even if you're not curable, you're treatable, um, it's manageable. And, you know, it is, I, I kind of hate this saying now after COVID, but, you know, it's a new normal and it's a new way of life, but you still have life left. And yeah, like, I just, I really like the silver linings that I've been able to take from it. Hmm. So like, um, what are things are there that helped you in your recovery? Um, really just the community of breast cancer, like the, the women that I've met. Um, and again, there's a couple of men that I've met, but just meeting with them and having them help me through my treatment, having them help me see the future, see silver linings, and then also just you know, sharing tips and tricks about icing your hands and feet during chemo, or, you know, if you are going to cold cap the best one to use and what to eat and, you know, what vegetables to increase, what herbs to increase, things like that. I just really like the community and the knowledge and information that was shared um, because it, it does no value to keep it to yourself. If I know something that's going to help someone else, why wouldn't I share that? You know, it's not going to help me to keep it. Um, and you know, that's why I wrote the book, uh, type a guide to cancer. I just really wanted to share the information that was shared with me, share the information that I learned, um, to forever help women, right. To forever help anyone going through, honestly, any cancer treatment, because chemo, chemo is going to do a number on you. And there's a lot of tips and tricks in there that aren't specific to breast cancer so um yeah but yeah mm, so actually what do people need to expect when they get this cancer type um i i, I just really feel like lately as of late especially with you know how much more social media is intertwined in our everyday lives and how we share information now that i think that cancer has been shown in a lens that's not true. You know, there's going to be the Hollywood side of it where all they talk about is losing your hair and wearing scarves. Um, but cancer is a real, it's a big deal. Like you're going to go through surgery and surgery isn't just getting a, a bre breast augmentation. Like a, a double mastectomy is an amputation. Um, it's going to take multiple surgeries to get not even back to get you to a place where you're comfortable um, in your new body, in your new life, with your new lease on life. So I, I would just say, I would throw out all the expectations that you have that are based on what you've heard um, from people who haven't gone through it or throw out everything that you've heard based on an interview that was heavily edited uh, by someone like, like massive cancer foundations or companies that want to um, put a, a specific light on a diagnosis or a treatment path and plan. Um, speak to survivors, speak to thrivers, speak to people that are going through it and you'll get a good picture and you'll get a real realistic expectation of what you're going to go through. But also I detail all of this in my book. Um, I, I detail everything from 
pre-diagnosis to diagnosis all the way through radiation, which was the end of my active treatment. And, you know, I talk about the good, the bad, the funny and the ugly and the sad, right? Um, I go through all the emotions in the book, like just to give a realistic 360 view of what it'll be. And there will be laughs. There Mm. will be things that are insane that you can't believe that are happening. There will be things that are unfortunate and sad, but it all comes back around. And, you know, again, it's, it's doable. Yeah. So often it's said that having a positive mindset and surrounding yourself with positive people is means helps you to recover faster. And it also helps you to uh, have the hope that you can fight back. So how do you feel more positive? Uh, I would feel, I would say to feel more, I, to how I feel more positive, you just have to let it come naturally. If you try to force anything or try to force like a toxic positivity, it, it can just snap back twice as hard. Right. So if you push anything or bend it too far, it's going to break. Um, but you'll find those times, right. So getting outside, you know, uh, exercise is a natural antidepressant. Uh, getting vitamin D, getting sunshine, being around people who make you feel good, being around people who you can talk about anything. If you want to talk about your diagnosis, you can. If you want to talk about the weather, you can. If you want to talk about a funny TV show, you can. But just kind of making your own narrative and uh, doing what you enjoy. If you want to get back to your old self, if, if working out made you feel good, if baking made you feel good, anything like that, then definitely do those things. If you want to find new hobbies, do those things. But for me, again, it was just letting that naturally come out. It was getting there and not just saying, be happy today. Because you need to feel your feelings and you also need to grieve to get through things. So if you just try to push through, you know, those feelings are going to surface. And if you try to push through, you might not be able to control how and when they surface. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So every crisis in life teaches you a particular lesson. So what life lessons has your cancer journey taught you? Um, specifically, it's taught me to mind my priorities and to put energy into the necessary things. Um, it's taught me not to engage on things that, you know, in your heart don't matter, um, that aren't going to be a problem tomorrow, right? I can't control if it's raining and it Mm -hmm. probably won't be raining tomorrow. So why am I worried about it? Um, I feel like I'm a lighter, less serious person. Um, sometimes that doesn't do me such a great service. (laughs) Some things are pretty serious, but, um, you know, again, facing your mortality is really going to change the way you look at a lot of things moving forward. So that's just where I am. And, um, yeah, like I said, it just helped me reprioritize things and people. And, you know, some people just don't have a place in your journey or in your new life. And that's fine. You outgrow people often. And, and as you should, because if you're growing or, and they're not, or vice versa, then someone's going to outgrow someone. And that really could be a nudge in the right direction for you to, um, for you to grow, um, for you to get a little uncomfortable if you were stagnant and maybe not, you know, looking at the bigger picture and things like that. But yeah, it just helped me really reprioritize things and, um, not take people for granted. Yeah. So uh, what was your first reaction when you got to know that your reports are finally showing cancer free? Um, I think I was both shocked and not shocked because again, that's what the doctor said would happen. Um, you know, I had a complete response to chemo, which I think about only a third of uh, patients receive. So, you know, that, that felt really good. And it felt like I was doing something right. It just felt like, you know, I stayed true to the path and what they had asked me to do and things were responding. And, and I know that's not, um, 
that's a different way of looking at it because if you don't have a complete response, that's not to say that you didn't do everything someone asked you. But just for me, having just been so shocked and my my life rocked by this diagnosis, it was just a step in the right direction and a really positive reinforcement for everything I'd gone through up to that point. Mm. So do you still go for prescribed checkups after your reports are cancer free? Yes. So, uh, yeah. So I was, I had a complete response to chemo that was on January 21st. I had surgery on March 2nd and was, uh, deemed cancer free from that pathology, you know, so March 2nd is kind of my cancer free date. Um, I continued immunotherapy through the end of September. So I was still in passive treatment, um, because that's targeted, um, uh, Herceptin, uh, but so I finished all treatment uh, in September. And so I'll go in every three months for blood work. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll be going in at the end of December for blood work just to make sure everything is still where it needs to be. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, gratitude seems to be the biggest strength to fight this situation. So what were you ever so grateful for that made you always... Uh, calm down after thinking or revisiting that memory? I think it's just the coping mechanisms that I learned um, in therapy and in hypnotherapy. And then also just not to worry about something that's not happening right now, you know, to, and, and that sounds oversimplified and it, and it is, I'm presenting it as oversimplification um, because you can just say, calm down but it's like, I know too much to calm down. I know what can go wrong. I know about the treatment that's needed to beat cancer. So, um, you know, you can tell yourself to calm down. If anybody else tells you to calm down, that's not going to work very well, but it's just the, the, the coping skills I've learned in therapy and in that, you know, those other treatments to get through it and whatever you need, if you need to cry because you've scared yourself or you've heard something that was a little scary or felt something a little scary, again, grieve that and then move on and take a breath and then look at the big picture, look at the probability of that. And then also get it checked out. You don't have to live with uncertainty. And so that's kind of my thought process. That's how it goes. I'll, you know, if I think about an intrusive thought or something that's, you know, concerning, then I, you know, I think it all the way through. And then also if I continue to have concerns, I just, I call my doctor. Hmm. So like, how is your life after cancer? Life after cancer is, I mean, it's kind of the, it's, it's a hybrid. It's a mix of what it was before and then what it was during treatment because, you know, I'm at a point where like any little ache and pain can't really be dismissed or ignored. So it's a hypervigilant state, you know, it's a lot of contact with my doctors, but also, you know, I don't have the fear of the unknown anymore. You know, two of the biggest fears that I would say universally anyone has is, oh no, I don't want cancer. And oh no, I don't want to die. So if those are the two biggest fears and someone's already broken through that first wall to tell me I had cancer, then it's double-edged. I know a lot and I know what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of, but also they've already told me I had cancer. So, um, yeah, life after cancer is just, it's hypervigilant, but it's also, you know, very, methodical to make sure that I am enjoying the little things that I'm not losing sight of this second lease and how fortunate that I was and continue to be mm, yeah so like have you ever asked yourself this question why me and if yes then how you like cope up with this thought I didn't ask why me until very very far into the process so um you know I was diagnosed uh, very early in September and I wouldn't, I'd say I didn't even ask why me until well after surgery. So after surgery, before radiation. So probably about six, seven months in. Um, and that, I think that was a result of the chemo doing the last process through my body. So, mm. you know, you've got that concentrated chemo of those four drugs, six sessions, 
you know, over four or five months and you, you know, you're hurting and you're still going through the side effects, but you've got surgery side effects and you've just had surgery. You've got anesthesia side effects and all these things. And so, yeah, I asked why me? And I just said, you know, what, what is the purpose of this pain? It wasn't really why me? It was like, please, show me what I'm supposed to be doing with this information. And again, it really dawned on me to write that book. So if, when, and when, and, or if anyone else had that, why me thought you would know it's not just you, you're not alone. This ha- this is how I have turned my pain into purpose. This is how others have turned their pain into purpose. So find yours. And I think that's a, a really helpful way through because you're not, you're still validating everyone's feelings because everyone's going to have different feelings about it, about treatment, about surgery, about their journey. But if you can say, this is what Lauren did with her pain. This is her purpose. So find yours, find yours, work your way through that. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's the only thing that helped me. Um, you know, I, I really, I didn't think I'd ever ask why me, but it got, it got really, really hard, really difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. So like, what would be a message to cancer patients and caregivers who are like still fighting this battle? Get as much information as you can. If you have gone to the doctor and you still have questions, write them down, call the nurse, have them ready for the next time you go in. Remember the opposition of fear is information. Um, Mm -hmm. Find your community, even caregivers, find a caregiver community, you know, find the humor in the day to day, find the joy in the small things like the ice cream. You're going through cancer treatment. You do not need to police your food. You can increase the spinach and the green juices you're drinking. That's great, but you don't need to police yourself and deprive yourself of ice cream or, you know, a slice of pizza, everything in moderation. So, um, yeah, I would just say, find your people, find an outlet, find a hobby and, you know, make yourself a priority. Yeah. Well said that make yourself a priority because uh, if it will take care of us, then God will take care. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So like, when did you think that I can beat this disease? Or was this belief always there with you? It was 50-50, you know, and my husband said the other day, he said, I never doubted anything. You know, you had a low stage. I know you, I know your heart. I know you're tenacious. And I said, well, that's great. Um, You know, so 50-50, just like the intrusive thoughts and then being happy, Um, you know, those kind of hinged on each other. I was fine and you know had a really positive attitude didn't ask why me just ready I was ready to get it over with ready ready to do my year of treatment right that's what the doctor asked and I said okay that's fine um and then there would be times where I was very weak and then that would roll into being very sad and then that would roll into a slight quick depression right like a little bout And, um, then that's when I would think, okay, then maybe I'm not going to beat this. And so again, it all just hinged on each other and I would go back and forth and, and then before you know it, you're finished and you're like, oh, thank God. I don't know how much more I could have (laughs) taken. Um, but that, I mean, that was my coping mechanism and, you know, I wish I could have been just steadfast and had all the faith all the time. But, you know, when those side effects hit you and that treatment hits you, it can get a little dark and you can get a little lost. So, yeah. So like, what do you think are the stigmas attached to cancer and the importance of awareness for it? Yeah, again, yeah. As I said earlier, I definitely think there's a lot of stigma attached to cancer. Uh, I, I think it's a lot of uh, victim or, you know, patient shaming. Like, what did you do to get it? Um, and so I think that with us talking about things more and, uh, you know, people reading my book and all these things that they'll see, it's not some, it's not always something you do. 
And again, I just think with getting the information out there and more patients and survivors and thrivers and previvors talking about their situation and, um, you know, their life and their habits, then we will destigmatize this soon, yeah. hopefully sooner than later. Hmm. So can you share an act of kindness that you will never forget? During your cancer yeah. journey? Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, this just comes on being seen and being active in the community, but I just got a, I got a, a, a huge target gift card in my email. Like, and they just said, this is for your baby. This is for diapers. This is for your family, whatever you need. Like, thank you for being in the community. And I posted about it multiple times, like, hey, who can I thank for this? Thank you so much. This means so much. And like, never got a response. No one knew. And, and it was just amazing. And it definitely, definitely helped. You know, when you're going through treatment, if you're working, I worked all the way through treatment. I, I you know, I took short term during my surgery and radiation, but I worked all the way through chemo. And sometimes you just have to take days off. And some of those days are unpaid if you're out of PTO and, um, you know, when you do short term, that's a portion of your income, a percentage. And so on top of these expensive treatments, you're also making less. And, and you, again, being a mom is a full time job and you don't get time off from that. And so just to be able to provide for your family with someone's act of kindness, like really, really, really resonated with me really and helps. Um, helps me give back. Yeah. So these act of kindness only like make us believe that there is still kindness and helpful people out there in the world. Oh yeah. I mean, you never know when you're going to find someone um, who's going to be able to do something like that for you. And they mm -hmm. could be big grand gestures or they could be tiny and they all, you know, they all hit a different spot in my heart. Um, you know, I've been reconnected with people I've lost touch with, and I've lost touch with people that I was heavily connected with. And, um, you know, meals show up at the door, um, you know, people drop off food, knowing you can't cook. And, you know, even those little acts of kindness mean a lot to you. It doesn't always have to be, you know, financial. Hmm. Like what have you learned over the years during your cancer journey that, uh, you think that would lead you to a better future? just um how cancer is a great equalizer right so it doesn't matter how much money you have um you can still get it so we do live in a world that does not equally distribute access um so that would be where you know your financial standing would come into play would be your treatment but again on the on people who are diagnosed, you know, that is cancer is a great equalizer. So, you know, when you have a, a room full of women who have lost their hair or lost their breasts or, you know, even other cancers, right? So everybody, everybody in the room with you, with your cancer, you know, you get to learn a lot about people. I'm not just a black woman who had cancer, who is now bald. I'm a mother. I work in corporate America. I have a podcast. I am an author. Right. And so, um, I just learned, I, I relearned and it was refresh in my mind that we are all individuals and we all have so much to give. And so you just, you need to learn people. You actually need to get to know them and learn them. And I haven't met a breastie that I, I haven't loved so mm. yeah so like what are the things that you appreciate or love about yourself I would have to say it's my tenacity uh because it was the tenacity that led to the diagnosis uh the tenacity that led to the mammogram that led to the diagnosis that saved my life just being vigilant you don't have to be hyper vigilant you know sometimes that gets stressful but knowing signs, knowing that you don't have to be of a certain age to be diagnosed, just being educated as much as you're able um, on these things. Um, I heard something last month in Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, that really stuck with me. You know, at this time, we don't have a cure for breast cancer. So 
breast cancer, unfortunately, is unavoidable at the moment, but catching it at the earliest stage is going to be the best way to save your life and avoid additional aggressive treatments. So, um, yeah, just knowing, just being educated and yeah. putting that so, education in motion. Hmm. So as you said that, um, it's in the past month when we all were celebrating the breast cancer awareness month. So early detection is very important. So it can be possible with the help of self-examination. So what do you think is the importance of self-examination and why? Uh, I think it's very important for early detection. I think it's very important. So you have a baseline on your body and you know your body. So if you recognize any changes like armpit pain or a lump, then you will be best educated to be able to communicate that to your doctor and save your life. Hmm. Yeah. So if you have to sum up your journey in one sentence, then what would that be? If I what? If you have to sum up your journey in one sentence, then what would that be? The journey of a lifetime. <laughs> So, you know, your story is really inspiring. And I hope this session really motivates people out there who are traveling or who have been traveled through this journey. So it was lovely having you here today on this session with us, Lauren. So thank you so much for your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah.